Welcome to the latest episode of the Arbury Road podcast. This week we're going to be talking about populism in Europe and populism in general. And we have three very special guests who I'd like to introduce now. First up, we have Tiago Carvalho. Tiago currently works as a researcher at the Center for Research and Studies in Sociology in the Lisbon University Institute. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Cambridge, and he did his postdoc in Florence. Hello, Tiago. Hi, how are you doing? Very well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Next up, we have Maria Mendez. So Maria holds a PhD from the Social and Political Science Department of the European University Institute. She's currently a research associate at the Mercator Forum for Migration and Democracy in Dresden. Hi, Mariana. How are you? Hi, all good. Thanks. Fantastic. Finally, we have another Tiago, just to make things confusing. Tiago Moreira Ramayo. So Tiago is a postdoctoral researcher at the ULB University in Brussels, and he holds a PhD in political science from Sciences Po. He has a master's degree in international political economy from King's College London, and has worked as an economist in the Portuguese administration. Hello, Tiago. Hi. How are you doing? Very good. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. So let's dive right in. And first question I'm going to throw out to Tiago Carvalho. Would you like to tell us what is populism? Maybe some historical context, where it emerged, how it has changed, what it looks like today, something like that. Sure, uh, and thank you for the invitation to be here today as well. Um, I think I'm looking forward to discuss with Mariana and Tiago on the topic. Well, I mean, populism, tends to be a very contested, uh, especially in academic debates, the, you know, in more general uh, uses of the words, uh, um, but especially in academic debates, it tends to be very contested and not so well defined. It, it became sort of uh, a fashion in, in academic studies, but we kind of agree that populism can be defined uh, more or less as, a, you know, a use uh, an ideology or a discourse that tends to oppose um, two sets of groups or, or uh, basically um, um, the people against the elite. So basically the po populist parties or movements tend to simplify their, uh, a lot what, um, what, what how society is structured, right? So they have this division between the pure people and the corrupt elite. That's the more or less um, the definition that we kind of agree in, in academia, if you want. Um, and, and, you know, you have this political party and charismatic leader representing the will, the general will of, of the people. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much. Mariana, I'm going to come over to you for the next question, which is something Tiago has touched on there. And Speaking as a non-expert on the topic, I think there is a lot of blurring between populism, right-wing extremism, fascism, nationalism. These kind of terms seem to merge together, leaving people with, I think, a lack of true understanding of these terms. Can you explain a little bit how populism interacts and has interacted with these other movements, such as fascism, nationalism, and right-wing extremism? Yes, uh, yes, I can. But before directly replying to your question, I would add something to Tiago's answer, which mm -hmm. actually then uh, adds to the to the response to this question. So, um, besides this anti-establishment rhetoric, and besides the the opposition, the simplistic opposition between the people and the corrupt elites. Um, there's also the fact that populism tends to be considered at its core, in its essence, anti-pluralist. Um, why is this important? Because, well, populists, they take the people as a homogeneous, unified group, right, with a single will. And this is problematic. Why? It's, it's already anti-pluralist in itself because it does not recognize the legitimacy of difference, of different social groups with different values and interests. And by claiming that they alone represent the people, 
and that therefore that their political opponents do not represent the people or even worse are the enemies of the people, they very much tap into the same anti-pluralist logic. And this is why populism is often considered dangerous for democracy. Uh, because, well, it undermines pluralism and it undermines some basic democratic rules like treating citizens as equal, or uh, as I said, respecting difference both at the elite level and the, at people's level. So that being said, and um, to respond to your second question on, uh, on um, the relationship between populism and nationalism or even fascism, um, it's true that populism does not have to be strictly connected to nationalism, but in practice, it often is. It of, they are often part and parcel of the same discourse. And why is that? Because the people that is invoked by, uh, by populist discourse often corresponds and goes together with the nation or the national people. Um, this is obviously the case for radical right parties, or extreme right parties um, in which they, they combine, and this seems to be the successful formula nowadays, they combine the, the populist anti-establishment appeal with nationalism or what is sometimes called nativism. What is nativism? It's basically an obsession with the ethnic homogeneity of the nation or with the dominance of one ethnic group at the same time that uh, non-natives are considered a threat. And um, nativist appeals, they have considerable, considerable popular resonance and they are therefore a useful tool to populists. Uh, it's another way for populists to defend the people or the nation against its enemies. And the enemies are not only the elites, but are sometimes minorities or, or immigrants. Uh, so this is how it relates to, often relates to nationalism. Now, how does it relate to, to fascism? Um, first of all, there is much populism in fascism, but fascism is more than that. There are two key differences between uh, populism and fascism. Uh, the first key difference, I guess the most important, is the use of violence. Uh, a second difference would be the, that fascism rejects democracy to court. There's an outright rejection of democracy, while in populism, um, this is not the case. Thanks very much. Tiago Moreira, I'm going to hop over to you for the next question. Sure. So, Mariana spoke a bit about the, the common the feature, the characteristics of populism there. And from my own limited reading on the subject, um, I find that there are, it's populists and populist leaders and populism tend to gain traction or become more popular in response to some particular phenomena that happen in society and the economy at certain times. Would you be able to go into a few of those aspects and talk about what populism reacts to? Sure, but, but like just like Mariana did, I'm going to go back to what the others said. Please do, uh, add, add as much as you want. I, I, I do think that um, there are some fundamentally problematic issues with the use of the term populism, uh, certainly in academic discourse um, and you know, even even more in, in, in the public sphere. Because, and this touches upon something that Mariana actually said, said at some point, that was the idea that populism can be dangerous to democracy. And we have in the general discourse um, created this sort of equation between what we think to be dangerous to democracy and what we think uh, to be populist. So, for example, widespread mobilization, for example, like the Gilets Jaunes um, in, in France was readily described as populist um, because it was seen in many respects as dangerous to democracy. But the fact is that in the end, the category of populism seems to be applicable to so many and so different phenomena mm -hmm. that one might argue, might argue and might question, does this actually apply anymore? Has the concept been so stretched to the point that it does, it's, it's not meaningful anymore? Because even in the sort of very 
soft definition that Tiago proposed. And by the way, Tiago's proposal was is actually the consensus. Uh, when when these when these terms are used, it's typically in those terms. So it was well defined for the current standards of academia. But even then, we can say that it's actually a very hollow kind of definition. I mean, the idea of representing the people, almost every political force at some point claims to represent the people and to represent the people as the people should be represented. So I think a very important issue here that we should always bear in mind is the normative dimension of the very use of the concept of populism that is not used in a sort of, well, one could argue that nothing is used in a purely neutral analytical way, but populism in particular tends to be always used in a sort of very normatively charged kind of uh, um, even attack on these, on these forces that we deem potentially dangerous or problematic as opposed to more traditional and possibly comfortable kinds of institutions like traditional parties, traditional trade unions, and so on. And so how do they, how do they actually uh, evolve and how do they develop is very interesting, especially because of the terms in which you asked the question, because you asked the question in reaction to what do they, do they grow? Mm -hmm. And the question might actually be asked, how do these movements actually, actually create the conditions for their own growth? Because to a lot, to a large extent, what we see in these movements is what in academia growing as as has been discussed as the, 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 the social construction of crises. That is, uh, it's not necessarily the case that there's a sort of external reality that is objective and apparent to everybody, and these groups just come and try to argue for solutions for these problems. It's often the case that these groups actually create the collective understanding of something as problematic, of something as critical. And so, for example, you have in Europe, you have the problem of the migration crisis. That was, the, you know, the arrival of, you know, a substantial number of people, but for the standards of the population in Europe, it was not, you know, it was not a, a, grand, a great replacement like some French uh, intellectuals like to argue, um, was construed as a very problematic crisis. Um, the crisis, of course, the crises, the economic crises that Europe went through uh, are also construed in a certain way so that these movements present themselves as the, the solution to this crisis. And you can also think of the problems of the legitimacy of the state and legitimacy of the European Union, that to some extent, these movements are the ones raising these problems and raising these questions. And we can argue if they are raising these questions appropriately or not. But the fact is they are the ones raising these questions and then presenting themselves as the solution to these problems. What is interesting in the end is that because these processes of social construction of crises um, do not stem from, as I was saying, some readily apparent sort of objective uh, 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 framework, what we have is on polarization, but more than polarization, we have a degree of incommensurability in the sense that what some groups see as a crisis is not understood as a crisis by other groups. And so it's not just polarization in the sense that different groups disagree on something, is actually in common stability in the sense that different groups don't even agree on the terms of the reality they are discussing. And so you actually have this, and I believe we are going to touch on this in the American case in which the degree of polarization has reached levels in which, you know, collectively it's hard to find an agreement on whether the election was fair or not. Some of the very basic structures of this society cannot, cannot be agreed upon. Um, but generally speaking, you have, for example, in Europe, this indeed this incommensurability between the populist right, for example, that sees Europe as a fundamental problem in the, in the well-being of, of, of citizens of different countries in Europe, and the sort of pro-European pro -European, uh, um, movements and parties and political forces that just don't see the reality in the same way. So just following on from what you said there, um, from from my understanding of what you said, these po populist leaders, they'll often create the problems that they can fix by the will of the people. They don't. It's not they. It's not that they create the problems. I mean, we should we should not say that you know it's not the, the, the it's not it's not Salvini that created the, the the migration crisis, but these groups, let's say. The way in which we understand social reality as, for example, going through a crisis, 
is in itself debatable, right? I mean, we can very much disagree to the extent to which there was a migration crisis in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. We could actually say that the problem, the, the, very, the actual crisis was not the crisis of people coming, but the crisis of not allowing people to come. Uh, and again, this is the incommensurability uh, thesis working that you have some people for whom the actual problem is the thousands and thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean. And for other people, the problem is the ones that actually managed to get in, right? The issue here is that different actors, and this touches on Tiago's point on charisma, different actors are able to mobilize discourses and mobilize people around specific types of ideas, specific types of narratives, specific types of, you know, general general reference points in society so that these communities, these groups understand a certain, a certain situation, a certain set of circumstances as posing a crisis and oftentimes a sort of existential crisis that raises anger, that raises mobilization, that raises all of these sort of very, uh, very fervent kind of, kind of sentiment. Uh, it's not the case that they create the crisis, it's just the case that they see reality in, in a certain way that generates a, the collective understanding of a, of a phenomenon as a crisis. I think, so, I think better ahead. than using the word creating would be magnifying. They magnify issues to, to a much greater extent that, than you would need to magnify them. And they, they, frame it, they frame these issues, existing issues, in a way that it becomes seen as a problem or as a threat. Now, I really like Tiago's constructivist approach, but if, if we want to be more realist, let's say, if I can use this term, um, in academia, there's usually a debate over uh, what fosters populism, and it's basically down to two things, economic anxieties and cultural anxieties. And there's a debate between these two, whether it is a cultural backlash against you know, multiculturalism, immigration, and so on, or whether it, it is more driven by economic anxieties, and namely the, um, the, um, the economic crisis since 2008. And I think there is um, quite a consensus that cultural backlash tends to play a greater role than economic anxieties when it comes to radical right populism. Here I'm referring only to the, to the radical right, which is what I know best. Um, but one should not downplay the extent to which cultural anxieties are also based on economic concerns. But I think this point, this is the traditional and, and the cultural backlash. It's, it's sort of what Pippa Norris argues and so on. And, and, and it's true that it's, it has become the sort of perhaps the most influential kind of account. But mm -hmm. this point that these are, it's very actually challenging analytically to completely disentangle culture and, and the economy in these issues. Um, it's actually quite problematic, problematic to do it. And also, um, so on the one hand, it's not very clear the extent to which we can disentangle them. And also it's not very clear the extent to which they are comprehensive. Because for example, when it comes to the rise of popul the populist right in particular, when it comes to uh, the critique of Europe and the critique of the legitimacy of the state and the legitimacy of the European construction project, yeah. it's very difficult to actually put this this, this, sort of, this sort of driver of these forces in either the culture or economy box. Yeah. So I think that we have to take these sort of drivers uh, with a grain of salt because the re typically, yeah. uh, typically reality is much more sort of nuanced and complex than, than what these sort of categories and ideal types can lead us to think. Yeah, yeah. And actually to these two, I would add a third important one. And to be fair, there are uh, other authors also pushing for the, a third avenue, which has to do with, uh, with the crisis of legitimacy of, uh, of party democracy and um, of supranational institutions, including the EU. Also, uh, you know, an example of, of popular backlash, if you want, with, yeah, I mean, which is very much related with, with immigration, but not only, you know, because populists on the right, um, um, on the left, it's another case because that's 
you know, we've been talking mainly about the, the, the populism on the right, but it's also populism on the left, and they have a very, very different logic in the way they say, as Tiago was referring, as, you know, not only the construction of problems, um, or so, social problems, but also in terms um, of, of the construction of the people. While the left tends to be more inclusive, although there is a division, still a division between uh, the people and the elite, but you know the, the populist right also tends to um, add another layer to that, which is uh, those outside the people, which tend to be migrants. And one of the ways they tend to signify that, uh, and it's very interesting, is with religion, with the appeal to Christianity as a shared understanding of civilization uh, in Europe, for instance. Uh, but also in the U.S. Uh, and, and other parts of the world, the use of religion tends to be um, uh, very used to mark who is inside and who, who, who are the in-groups and who are the out-groups. And in the case of religion, it's very interesting because, for instance, uh, a case like Le Pen, Le, the party uh, that she leads is a secular party. None, nonetheless, um, she uses religion to say, well, you know, we are fighting against... Um, the is you know Islam these migrants who are you know there's a, a cleavage between the civilization and barbarism if you want almost in which um, despite being secular parties they use religion to as a marker of identity to say well you know even though we you know are secular parties there's a shared understanding of of the European civilization as as um, you know as being as having roots in Christianity. Um, so yeah, that, that could be an example as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I hadn't really considered religion at all um, on the topic. So touching on, on a couple of things um, you've all mentioned, um, it's fair to say that economic down, downturn or economic crises, economic troubles can play a big part in the rise of populism. Now, in European terms, it's fair to say, I think at the moment, populism is on the rise in many, many European countries, but it seems to always be the same countries who have long-term unstable economies in which populism tends to rise to the top, to thrive, to actually impact on policy or on government. And how does the left in particular uh, get the attention of the socio-economically deprived class to drag them away from populism, to give them an alternative to populism. Why are we seeing over and over throughout history that there's economic struggle and right-wing populists are the ones who gain, who grab the imagination of the people? What have the left done incorrectly over the last years, decades? I think one of one possible avenue there would be to ask what left um, and uh, the extent to which the uh, you know, the extent to which the left in Europe, in, in, a, in a number of countries in Europe, was actually capable of um, maintaining a sort of, a sort of heritage of social protection and redistribution and all of these, all of these standards of what we used to um, uh, associate to the so-called European social model and so on and so forth. Um, what you have, I mean, what you have starting in the 90s, late 90s, with the new labor, with all of these third way kind of movements is a shift of traditional parties, traditional social democratic parties, not only in the UK and in Germany, there are sort of the ones that are typically referred to as the most prominent ones, with Blair and new labor in the UK, and Schroeder and the, the Hartz reforms in Germany, but all around in Portugal, in Spain, in Greece, in all of these countries, you had a movement of the traditional left-wing parties towards the center and sort of a neoliberalization of the discourse of these parties that started, you know, raising the importance of free markets and raising the, 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 the importance of reducing the burden of the state and, and, and all that kind of, 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 of buzzwords. And to some extent, to some extent, this populist shift, the so-called populist shift on the left um, in recent years, actually is just the attempt of some of these, typically within these political parties and within these political, these political forces, the attempt to go back 
to some of the claims that were actually taken for granted a few years ago, 20 years ago, or something like that. Um, and of course, I mean, even the extent to which the extent to which Corbyn is populist, or the extent even to which Syriza is populist, sometimes I it's very clear that Podemos presents itself in the tradition of populism, the intellectual tradition of populism in a sort of very academic way. But the other, the, uh, some of these other parties are just going back to, you know, union-based kind of claims of left-wing, traditional left-wing parties that like to have, you know, better housing, better social protection, reduced uh, uh, university fees, better school services, better public transportation. You know, Corbyn was not claiming for the fall of the British monarchy. Corbyn was not claiming for, uh, you know, the toppling of the Oxbridge system of production of elites. Uh, he was basically arguing for, you know, good old social democratic policies. Uh, and again, the problem coming back to the problem of the normativity and the normative uses of these terms is actually that some of the parties and some of the political actors that have been more or less established, and again, we, of course, we talk about the establishment, very readily call these forces populist because they challenge them. And because we make this equation between populism and danger, <laughs> Uh, it's actually the very first thing that these forces, the established forces do is to call all of these parties populist. Um, but the burden of the proof is actually on the ones that call them populist to actually show how are they populist. I very much well, agree with your point and I think it touches upon the, the crisis of party democracy that I was trying to refer to. And I think this is uh, one reason why populists are thriving if you wish but actually coming back to your question i would be more skeptical about this direct link between economic deprivation and the rise of populism because we do see populists also thriving in prosperous countries um, poland for example was one of the countries least affected by the economic crisis and it continues to have a positive economic performance and nonetheless it has a populist in government um, Germany and, and the rise of AFD. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Or countries like Switzerland or Austria, which have very successful radical right populist parties. Um, I think more than um, maybe speaking of economic deprivation or rather inequality, um, maybe speaking of the Latin American context would, uh, would make more sense in the, in the framework of left-wing populism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but this relationship between economic deprivation and populism in general is uh, not so clear. Have we seen then, if, if we're saying that we can see a, a rise in populism even in thriving economies, can we think of any examples throughout history where populists have risen to the point of governing in thriving economies? Risen to the level of populist leaders being elected, populist parties holding government and successfully running a country in a, with a thriving economy. The obvious example would be Trump, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trump got into office in a moment in which the economy was actually doing okay. Um, it was actually recovering compared to other places in of the advanced economies. It was actually doing pretty well. Uh, so, I, I mean, you asked historically, so we tend to think, you know, back. <laughs> oh, back, no, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, but perhaps the best example that comes to mind is actually the, the most obvious one is Trump winning an election that nobody thought that he was going to win uh, in a situation in which the country was actually doing quite okay. Uh, in terms, in terms of, of economic standards. Um, I don't know if the others have other examples, but that's the one that actually springs to mind. I mean, the question is also that there were not a lot of populists in power, if we use the, the definition that we had here so far. And that's actually a very recent, uh, you know, if we think since the 90s, when populists start to incorporate and be part of cabinets around Europe, there are not a lot of parties, and that's that incorporated cabinets, populist parties, and that's something that ha has happened a bit more over the last, you know, um, ten years, so to say. 
and actually, you know, as Lerman was saying, it's, it tends to be on on countries that uh, are doing a bit uh, um, not so well economically, but still, you know, we, we also need to think of this as how do they access power and what, what is to access power as well, because, um, you know, you, you might be... A, a government like in Italy, you have the Five Star Movement with Le the League or Lega, uh, but you also had, um, you know, this coalition. But you also have, for for instance, the, the case of the Danish People's Party in Denmark, where they were never part of 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 government. They were they always stayed in parliament, but they were key to many of the policies that were done, right? You know, since like 2002 to 2000. In, um, 10, I think, they would give just parliamentary support in exchange of, um, of you know, very specific policies, such as migration policy. Denmark became one of the most restrictive countries in, ter in terms of mig migration policies, for instance. Uh, so being in power, being in government does not define everything um, and how influential these parties can be. Obviously, you know, then you have other, other parties such as Hungary and Poland. Um, where actually in Hungary they took over his, the, the institutions, but um, in, in a very in a very clear way. Uh, but being in power, you know, it's it, it it you know there are nuances to it about what means to be in power and like uh, being able to influence um, policy. Uh, definitely, there's this element to be considered that even if they are outside the cabinet, they do have an influence on policies. And that's not only a direct influence as the one uh, that Tiago was describing in Denmark, but also an indirect one. There are scholars who refer to the mainstreaming of the radical right <clears throat> in the sense that mainstream parties are actually getting closer to the radical right on some policy positions, namely on immigration, in an attempt to, you know, gather, gather votes uh, from, from potential uh, voters of the radical right. So taking populism in general, now that the fact that we've acknowledged it's not strictly a right wing phenomenon, it can also be on the left, it's not strictly fascism or authoritarian or anything like that. Do we see populism as a threat to core EU values at the moment? Looking at uh, Hungary in particular, you know, in Hungary they were given enough power, they, they had an overwhelming majority in parliament and that allowed them to, to completely subvert the institutions, to, to undermine the checks and balances, the, the independence of the judiciary, to undermine media pluralism, to enact a, a partisan constitution, to uh, colonize the state, to fill basically the civil service with loyalists, to, you know, uh, promote mass clientelism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if they are given the tools and if they are given the power, they, they can fundamentally undermine uh, democracy. Of course, it could be argued that this is easier in a, in a country like Hungary than in a country like uh, the US. Um, and can I just add something to what Mariana was just saying? Sure. It's, I, I'm going to stress this again, but the, from the moment in which we tend to describe any danger to democracy as populist, it's almost circular and tautological to argue that populism is dangerous to democracy. But I think we are actually, when we are thinking about this, we tend to be thinking about a very specific type of populism that is a right-wing populism, that is the, the movements that claim for a liberal democracy, that to some extent there's even debate to the extent to which we should call them populist and we should not just call them other things. Paxton just said he was reluctant, reluctant to, but Trump is a fascist. And to a, <laughs> to a large extent, I think that we are failing to call these movements and these actors fascists because we actually miss the analytical lenses to understand the forces of mobilization that they have. It's not the cafe anymore, it's not the basement anymore, it's not the little commune anymore, but it's the Facebook group, it's the WhatsApp group. And it doesn't mean there's no mobilization, militia making and armed mobilization. But all of this, it's, it's for the next question. The point about the danger to democracy, I mean, I think, uh, and, and, of, and of course, one could argue that I am biased here, but I, I don't see how we can ever say that Podemos was a danger to democracy. Quite the opposite. 
I don't see how we can say that Syriza was a danger to democracy. Actually, if there was a source of proper thinking about the problems of democracy in Europe, it came from Syriza, especially in the crisis of 2015. So actually, we, again, the problem with the concept of populism is that we end up putting under this umbrella so many different forces that we might actually miss fundamental differences. These forces that are typically called populism of the left actually have been very strong supporters of democratic values, of transparency, accountability, and so on and so forth, oftentimes against against the will and the, and, the, and, the, and the clear opposition of more established forces that are supposed to be uh, aligned with the core European values that we so often hear about. Uh, so I think this distinction is actually very important to make. I very much agree with Tiago, but the issue here is that we are working with different conceptions of populism. Yeah. To be fair, <laughs> mine is a lot more restricted, and I wouldn't apply it neither to Syriza nor even to Podemos. You know, Tiago has a point there. I think, uh, you know, if anything, Podemos in, in Spain actually uh, did, did one thing, which was to, um, you, know, um, you know, say what was going wrong and actually to make, for instance, a party like the Socialist Party, the Center Left Party, to come more to the left and, and you know, um, and to um, bat again on more redistributive, redistributive uh, policies, for instance. So, you know, saying that all, all populism is dangerous and anti-pluralist, I mean, I think, I think that's, um, you know, that's dangerous, so to say as well. I think there are very, it's, it's, it's very nuanced and we, you know, and say that all populist parties uh, are in a way uh, a threat to democracy. I'm not so sure about that. I think it depends from case to case, the political conditions under which they are, um, uh, you know, working or acting. But also there's something that I wrote in my notes that I, that I, you know, uh, one of the things that, nor, you know, if we think that it's a threat, I think it's much more a threat to, in presidential systems than in, in, in parliamentary democracy. Uh, and that's a thesis that's coming about every now and then that, you know, because presidential systems like the US tend to concentrate power in one person, in one cabinet, and, you know, um, instead of like places like uh, Greece or Germany, where you have, a parliamentary democracy with coalitions and so on that these parties actually have to negotiate. Of course, we can't um, we can't lump populist movements all into one collective bag. They're all the same in every country. That would be that's that's of course not the case. So the last question I want to throw out to you guys before we wrap things up, um, and again it's to do with Trump and the state. We all saw what happened last week in the U.S. Capitol. Is there a danger of? any of the populist movements in Europe and any European countries reaching that breaking point? And if we do anticipate some sort of massive, almost even violent mob-like backlash like we saw in the US, what can governments, citizens, and the general population do to counteract this or to protect ourselves, our democracies, and our citizens from these, let's call them threatening populist movements? I do think that we are a bit more protected in Europe, so to say, because we have parliamentar parliamentary institutions that actually uh, lead to negotiation between actors. It doesn't mean that, you know, like as Mariana was saying before, that uh, right-wing parties or center-right parties come close to some of the proposals of, of, of populist radical right parties. Um, but I mean, I think one of the things besides these strong institutions is also uh, you know, uh, to have inclusive welfare, you know, like that the resentment that is created, like the, the, the economic anxiety that we were discussing at the beginning uh, can be uh, um, uh, moderated and, and, you know, it doesn't fit into the sort of divisions that um, populist, especially the populist uh, right tends I might be a little optimistic here, but at least in the very short term, I don't see something like uh, what happened in the US happening here in Europe, uh, especially Western Europe. Um, 
I think that in the US with Trump, we've had uh, big warning signs already for quite a long time, even before his election. If you think back of his 2016 campaigns, uh, you already had very warning signs there, namely in terms of his very weak commitment to the normal democratic rules of the game, to uh, denial, complete denial and demonization of the legitimacy of his political opponents. Um, also already some toleration or even encouragement of violence by his supporters. So, you know, he takes all this, what uh, some authors have, um, have uh, described as these authoritarian boxes. And you already saw that in 2016, and you saw that coming from a politician within a mainstream party in a bipartisan system. And you see how he completely subverted the, the Republican party. And uh, so far, I don't see this so clearly happening in, uh, in mainstream parties in Western Europe. So I, 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 th I think the, first of all, if it happens, we are probably not going to predict it very well. Um, <laughs> That's for things, sure. <laughs> uh, uh, this all would be very much easier. Um, I think that first of all, we have to take into consideration that what happened in the capital happened at the federal level. Uh, and the, the appropriate comparison would be, could we imagine a, a mob invading Brussels uh, in Europe? Sort of to put the, the comparison at the same level of governance, let's say, even though, of course, it's not a state and so on. Uh, I think that's just, I, I don't think that's even imaginable uh, for a number of reasons, because of, you know, different languages, not, not an actual public sphere and so on. So then we can ask, could this happen in specific countries in Europe? Not in Europe in the sense of the European, the European Union, but in specific countries in Europe. And if there's one country that I think might see something like this happening at some point would be France. Uh, of course, all of this is very, uh, uh, you know, we are shooting predictions. Uh, I think there's a, there's a number of reasons that makes this less likely in Europe. We could believe that. Things like, you know, people are not as armed, for example, and don't have, there's not such mm. a ethos of uh, rebellion against the state. There's a sort of a, a collective understanding of the state as legitimate um, and more trusting institutions typically as well. But, but uh, we do see, we do see even with all of these differences in place, we do see in some countries in Europe, a clear shift towards more authoritarian kind of, kind of postures both in these sort of right-wing opposition and even in the mainstream uh, parties. It's very difficult nowadays to understand what Darmanin, for example, is doing in France that would be so different from what, you know, a Front National Minister of the Interior would do, for example. I mean, I, do, I don't think I'm exaggerating here when you have the Ministry of the Interior in France saying that he's against the selling of communitarian and ethnic food in supermarkets, referring specifically to kosher and halal food. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you would, you know, expect from a right-wing minister of the interior, not from a supposedly liberal uh, pro-European uh, uh, minister. Um, and you do have, you do have a tradition in France of much more sort of a um, armed and violent kind of insurrection. And even recently with the Gilets Jaunes, you had episodes of much tension. Mm -hmm. If there is a situation in which Marine Le Pen reaches the presidency in France, because we are talking here about Trump in the end of this first term, if we have a similar situation with Marine Le Pen at some point winning the election, and we've been, we've been farther from that scenario, uh, I could conceive of something around those lines potentially happening in France. I don't know about other countries in Western Europe. I know even less about other countries in, in Central and Eastern Europe. I don't think it's as likely in others, but in France would be the one I'd be most worried about. Um, trying not to be too pessimistic here, but that's the one that worries me. Okay, perfect. We're gonna have to leave it there, everybody. Tiago Carvalho, Mariana Mendez, Tiago Moreira, thank you so much for joining me. It was an absolute pleasure.